Good morning as we go to the chitas of today. Um, we're holding Tuesday, which is the third reading in the portion of Sab. We are holding in the book of Leviticus, chapter 7, verse number 11. And this is the law, the Torah, of a law of a Zevach HaShlomim, of a sacrifice that is a priest offering to God. Ashiyak Hashem, which a person brings to our Kaddish Baruch This is what the Torah wants you to uh, do. If he brings a thanksgiving offering. Mi'ifkir al zega al v'hikrim, al zevach Torah, and he shall bring with his thanksgiving offering halis matzes, unleavened mixed, unleavened matzes mixed with oil of Hashem, rekike matzes, meshuch of Hashem, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil, selus meruveches, and he shall bring uh, a scolding flour mixed with oil. Now she says he has three different menchais, really. Now she says, Meaning, if he brings the off to give to God for a miracle that happened to him. For instance, those who made a sea voyage and returned safely, or those who journeyed in the desert, or those who were imprisoned and were subsequently released, or a sick person who recovered, all of these are required to give thanks, called a taida. To give thanks. Today we have a Birchus Hagoymel. Uh, we thank God for the miracle that happened. Um, as it's written, they shall give thanks to the Lord for the kindness and for his wonders to the children of men. men. And they are slaughtered sacrifice, and they shall slaughter sacrifice of thanksgiving. If one account of one of these, one vowed to bring these peace offerings, they are called Shalmei Taida. Thanksgiving peace offerings, which are required the accompanying of a meal offering mentioned in this, in this passage. And they may be eaten only for the day that are, they are offered and the night that followed, as it's going to be specified here. So now she says there are four kinds of chalice. There are four kinds of bread, chalice, loaves, rechikim, which is wafers, rebucha. Golden loaves, which are which are three types of unleavened bread, mats, as written unleavened loaves. Each kind consists of ten loaves. Thus, as explained in the Gemara Talmud, that the total value of all accompanying bread amounted to five Jerusalem slah, sell, sell, which one Jerusalem sell equals one two fifths of an eighth. Which is equivalent to six saw by the desert standards, which one saw of a desert standard smaller than Jerusalem measure equals one third of an eighth. Because all loaves comprise a volume of 20, 20, 20 tenths of an eighth. Now, each leaven loaf comprised a volume of one tenth of an eighth. Thus, since there were 10 of these loaves as above. The total unleavened volume was one eighth. The unleavened volume, meaning the total volume of the three kinds of unleavened loaves, are equal to one eighth. Hence, the total volume accompanying the bed, bread was 20 tenths of an eighth. Well, I think I have now, I found this paper. Oh, I still don't have it, okay. How much exactly is an eifa? I'm not sure. Moroveches lechem, Rashi says, means bread made from dough that was thoroughly scalded in, in hot water. Let's continue.
AFA is 6.5 gallons. 6.5 gallons. So, gallons are the same thing as pounds. I'm not sure exactly. Okay, continue. Verse number 13. Along with loaves of leavened bread, Yaakov is Kabani, he shall bring his offering. On the Thanksgiving peace offering. Yashi says, in addition to verse 12, repeats the, the link between the accompanying bread and the sacrifice itself. This tells us the bread does not acquire instinct holiness, that it should become invalid if taken out of the holy place, base of Midrash, or it becomes in contact with its full yame, a person who immersed in, uh, in, uh, has immersed for his uncleanness, but is not yet brought to the carbon sacrifice. And that it cannot be redeemed to become non consecrated until sacrificed, until the Thanksgiving peace offer is accompanied and it's slaughtered, it's until the carbon was brought. It still didn't have the um, the uh, the the laws of a carbon yet. They shall bring from it one of each as an offering to God. It shall be to the Kayin. Isaiah the one who dashes the blood. Ashlamim la'ir, the peace offering shall be his. I said each one loaf of each kind. It was three kinds. Each one was ten loaves. One loaf of each kind. So we take shall, he shall take these as a truma, a separation for the kain, officiating the sacrifice. The rest of the sacrifices eaten by the owner. So here. The mincha can be eaten by the owner, by the one who brings the carbon trader. With the exception of the breast and the thigh, as the waving of the breast and the thigh of the peace offering is delineated below, and the Thanksgiving offering is called a peace offering, and that's why it goes to the kayin. That's why a peace offering was given part to the kayin, part to the base, to the, to the mezbeah, was burnt on the altar, the innards, the fats, and partially was given to the Jew who ate the carp, who brought the carp. Verse number 15. The flesh of, in the flesh of the Thanksgiving peace offering. The Yom Kabani Yechol needs to be eaten that day. He's not going to leave it until the next morning. So it can be eaten that day and that night. Now she says this verse could have in its flesh, consequently, there are many inclusions here. Namely, to include the sin offering, the guilt offering, the ram of the Nazarite, the Chagiga, the festival offering, on the 15th day of Nisan, on the 14th day of Nisan, that you can eat the 14th until the 15th by morning, that they are be eaten only the, on the day they were offered in the following night. At the time limited for eating the flesh, so the time is limited to the bread also, to the mincha. He may, however, eat it during the entire night. If so, why does it be eaten until midnight? We know that we that the Chachamim said you should eat it until midnight in order to distance somebody from transgression. The Chachamim didn't want that you should leave it over and pass midnight. Because you'll fall asleep, and the next thing you know, it's the next day. So therefore, they said, end it by midnight. That's why we try to finish the first day there by midnight. Symbolic to the carbon Pesach that was eaten. The sages asked, they should eat the carbon Pesach until midnight. And if he brings a uh, sacrifice of a vow on a dove, a donation, a day that he brings a sacrifice, he shall eat it. And the next day, and, uh, and whatever is left over for it may be eaten. Now she says, that is not to bring to give thanks, but that is, he did not bring to give thanks for a miracle. 
it does not it does not require bread. A minister does not require a minister of a guy that's brought a carbon. And it may be eaten for two days, namely the day of the offering and the following day. So here you have two days and a night. So an offering of the dove can be eaten that day, at night, and the next day. So on the first day, it may be eaten. The Hebrew, literally whatever's left over, the vav, which is a pretext, is superfluous. And the word is to be understood as though it says hanaisa. There are many similar examples, and instead of saying hanaisa, it says vehanaisa. So vehanaisa, anything left over, you didn't finish the first day, can be eaten the second day. So a carbon nether and a dove, a vow sacrifice, or just a, just a charitable sacrifice, can be eaten for two days and one night. A carbon pesach only can be eaten for one day and one, and one night. And that's why the, 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 the sacrifice that was bought the 14th day, the carbon pesach, you had to eat it that night until next day. But the sages said, until midnight. Somebody leaves over the Zava. He leaves it over to the third day, at night, really the, the, the second night. That's called Noisa. That's called Noisa, leftovers. And not a lot of leftovers. Past, in this category, past two days. If you'll eat any flesh from this offering on the third day, Layyidatsa should not be accepted. Amakivay say, the one even brings it, it's not considered, it will not be considered a sacrifice. Layyidatshiv, it won't be considered a sacrifice. Pigalu, it's a disgrace. A nefesh alachelasi man, person that eats from the sacrifice past its time, Avayna Yisa Shakarius. Now she tells us over here, this teaches us not that he actually ate it after its time, even if he had a mind to eat it after its time. Over here, the table is referring to somebody at the time of slaughtering intended to eat it on the third day, in which case the sacrifice becomes invalid. One might think, however, the Torah means that the sacrifice does not become invalid because of intention, but if one eats it on the third day, that it becomes invalid retroactively. Therefore, the Torah says, Amakiv meaning that in invalidated only by the time of the sacrifice. That's a very, the, the Chacham learned the Pasuk a little more deeper than the simple looking at the Pasuk. But the Pasuk means that not that if I brought a sacrifice and I ate it after the third day. No, it invalid, invalidates retroactively the sacrifice. No. It's talking about when a person had a mind when he sacrificed that he's going to eat it past this time. So even though he brought a sacrifice, he had a mind that he's eating on the third day. And let's say he doesn't eat it on the third day, he eats it in the next two days. It's still invalidated. His machshav invalidates. That's the way the Gemara learns the possible. Even if he ultimately ate it in time, he had a mind. To eat it past its time, but he ate it in time. And nevertheless, it's Avaina Yisa, he carries the sin. And therefore, the Torah says you have to have intention to the right times of the sacrifice. You're not allowed to eat the sacrifice past its time. Verse 19. If and the flesh that will eat. By any that will touch this 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 flesh, this God, this this sacrifice that will touch anything that's impure. Layakal is not eat anymore. Becomes impure. Bashi Sarab has to be burned. Regarding flesh, anyone who's clean may eat flesh. See what that means? That Ash will explain. Babasa Rashi says this is the only this is talking about the only peace offering. That touches any unclean shall not be eaten. It's not to consider that, as he says, this verse is not referring to pigle. Pigle means things that I had in mind that will be for later. Vahabasa, Lanabes, why is it this, the word Vahabasa? 
the second time it occurs in this verse seems superfluous. However, it comes to include the limb part which went outside its prescribed boundaries to inform us that the inner part is permitted to be eaten. And that will be all the Gemara. It's kind of to do with it. If, if anything goes out of the base of Mikdash, for example, so then the inner, so you take off a part of it, it's prohibited, but the inner part of the animal can be. What is scripture coming to teach us here? What does it tell us? Since the Tater says, and the blood of your sacrifice shall be poured, and you shall eat the meat, one might think that only the owner may eat a peace offering. Maybe only a lot of, you know, if you want to eat meat, you have to bring it as a carbon. Because every blood needs to be sprinkled on the Mizbeah. So maybe as a Jew, you cannot eat meat. You have to bring every, any, any cow that you want to eat. You have to first bring it as a carbon and then take the leftover as, a, as, a, as, a, as food. So therefore, the Torah tells us, call Torah anyone who's clean can eat meat. And why would the Tater claim the Tachki did this means that I, I, this means all that I have forbidden you regarding a sin offering, a guilt offering, namely that if they go outside the hangings of the courtyard of the tabernacle or the boundaries of the tent or courtyard, that they become prohibited, as the verse says, they shall be eaten in the courtyard. Concerning this flesh of a peace offering, which is Kachin Kalan, sacrifice of a less degree of onus. I say anyone can may eat flesh even outside the temple court throughout the city of Yerushalayim. So therefore we know that Shlomim, for example, even the carbon Pesach, which people bought on the 14th day, they took the cow, they took the meat, the food outside of the basement, and they ate it in Yerushalayim. So Kachi Kala, any kind of peace offering is allowed to be eaten out of the base Amigdash, and other people can eat it. Even people that were not at the carbon, as long as they were tar, as long as they were pure, they can eat the carbon, the shlamin, the peace offering. But if they were impure, they wouldn't allow it. That's the next verse. If a person eats in the flesh of a peace offering of the Lord, and he's unclean, and that person shall be cut off. That Rashi says, along Rashi, which scripture is referring to uncleanness of the body, an uncleanly person who eats from the holy peace offering, in which case incurs cutters. However, one who is clean, who eats the unclean flesh of a peace offering, is not punished with cutters. Nevertheless, he's punished for transgression of scripture abomination. As the verse says, and the flesh that touches anything unclean should not be eaten. So if somebody's unclean, impure, and he eats a carbon, cutters. Somebody that's tar, that eats an impure un- un- carbon, carbon that became tummy, is not cutters. It gets, it gets lashes. And the flesh of an unclean shall not be eaten. The abomination of God and the unclean person who eats clean flesh, however, is not written explicitly in the Taylor. But our sage to derive from the Shava, and it's a similar wording that tradition in certain scripture passages that two common words called the Gzayn and Shava uh, or expressions serve as a link, the law of these seemingly unconnected passages. Here the word to Masai appears in the word verse. And since the prohibition of, in numbers as uh, the nation attached to it, so to here, our prohibition is considered to have abomination, a domination. Attached to it is a warning. Now, where, the th- where are three mentioned of punishment, of exorcism, regarding a person who eats holy sacrificed meat while his bloody, or his bloody is unclean? The first one is Leviticus chapter 22, verse 3. Any man amongst you of your offering who becomes near to the holy sacrifice and the so- soul shall be cut off. Where it comes near means to eat. And the second and third mention of the, this is verses 20 and 21, this week's Pasha. A rabbi is expanding this in the tractate of Shruas as follows. One of them is eaten in general law, 
one of them is needed to state a particular case, namely the peace offering, in order to preclude the eating of certain clean foods that are not sacrificed on, on the altar, which do not have the punishment of, ex, of cutters. And one of them is to need to teach us about a carbon oil of a yarn, an ascending and descending sacrifice, namely an offering that has different options, an animal, birds, flower, according to the ability of one brings it. When the verse says, incurs guilt, and he may bring a carbon oil of yarn to the title, explicitly referring to the case of a person is in an unclean state who defiles the sanctuary, meaning enters while he's unclean state and eats on the holy side. So we hear the Torah in essence telling us, the Torah just went through the different places. The Torah in essence tells us of a person that is unpure, comes into the base of Midrash, did unintentionally self understood, and he ate for the sacrifice. Somebody he came and he brought a shlomim, somebody else is shlomim, and he's unpure. If he did it intentionally, he gets cut us. He has cut us. God forbid. Cut us means you're cut off from God. Means in, in Allah and Torah, means you die before 60 is cut us. And now we can see a person who touches anything unclean, whether uncleanness for, from a human or uncleanness from an animal means a carcass. Or on any unclean carcass of an abominable creature, shekhet. So if a person becomes unclean, and he'll eat for the peace offering that he gave to God, that person is cut off. The concept of karis. God spoke to Moshe and Israel, speak to the Jewish people. They were saying, All fat of an ox, a canvas or a sheep, the A's or a goat, you now eat certain fats in the animal. Verse 24 and the fat of a carrion, dead animal. Ochel of trefa, the fat of a sick animal, which is a trefa, that you can use for anything you want. You can use it for any kind of work. Ochel will be not allowed to eat it. Ashi says, Yas lechom malacha. Over here, the Torah permits the use of a carrier. Surely the fat are included in the rest of the animal. What is it teaching us? It comes to teach us the fat does not impart the uncleanliness which imparted by a carrion in general. So in general, fats does not, if it's a kosher animal, fats does not make you impure. Even though we don't eat it, fats does not make you impure. I'm not talk about the fats you find out on the animal. This is specific fats the Torah talks about, the fats that's on top of the innards, on top of the, 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 the uh, kidneys, uh, the liver. There's certain fats that even today we take away, we don't eat. We already know that eating fat is prohibited, and we know that eating carrion and trefer is prohibited. But what is the verse teaching us? The answer is the Torah says the prohibition of carrion or trefer. Trefer means a sick animal. It means after we open up the animal, we shechted the animal, we opened up the animal, we found that the animal had certain sicknesses that makes the animal called a trefer. An avela is a dead animal that wasn't shechted. So both of them are unkosher, even though they're kosher animals. So number one is an avela is that wasn't shechted, it's not kosher, it wasn't slaughtered the way the Torah wants, Allah wants an animal to be slaughtered, it's not kosher. And even if the animal was slaughtered and we find it to be a treifa, we find that the animal was sick before it was even slaughtered, then the animal is also non kosher. That's why today a lot of animals. Uh, shech, that it might be good for the USD, it might be good for the American system, but it's not good up Allah. And the animals deem safer. It's an animal that found certain 24, I believe, problems that an animal can have that will make the animal unkosher, even though the USDA will accept it as a fit to eat animal. But in Torah law, it will be considered a safer. 
and then the animal becomes prohibited. You cannot use the animal for kosher. So this, uh, the, the prohibition of here, carrying tape is, uh, is imposed upon the prohibition of the fats and so far, and if somebody eats it, he's liable also to transgress from prohibited eating carrion and trefa and do not, and you do not say that one prohibition cannot be sold upon another. So if a guy ate in the animal and then he realized that it was trefa and it was a fat, he gets each and every Aveda. That means <laughs> you can have two Avedas happening at the same time. Whoever eats the fats of an animal. Which we brought as a sacrifice. This is a very important law. That's why eating kosher is also protecting the person from this law of chela. That the, all the chela, all the fats that are prohibited when it's done in a Jewish, uh, if it's done up here, in a kosher sporting house, they take away this chela. They make sure that this chela, this fats that is prohibited, is not. Does not get does not does not part of the, any of the selling of the animal. Also, any blood you're not allowed to eat. You're not allowed to eat blood, whether it's blood of the bird or behem of blood of an animal. That's another problem. That's why years ago everybody used to people used to cash it themselves. But today, Baruch Hashem, when you buy meat, it's already checked not to have chaylev, not to be slaughtered correctly, and also to be salted and washed that all the blood has been taken out. As she says, excludes from this prohibition the blood of fish and locusts. So we know we don't salt fish. Fish is, the blood of fish is not prohibited. It's only the blood of animals and birds. Verse number 27. Any person that eats blood, that's how it shows how important the concept of buying meat that has been salted already. Because if anybody eats blood, you have cutis. Cut off from the Jewish nation. Cut off, you have cut it. You have cut it. You have cut it. You have given death. And God, God spoke to Moses saying, speak to the Jewish people. And anybody who brings a peace offering to God, when he brings his, his, his sacrifice to God, is from his peace offering. Yadid to Vienna, he shall, his own hand shall bring the fire offering to God, as chaylev, alachoza, fat, the breast, in Vienna, as a chaza, than the breast, to wave as a waving before God. That was part of the sacrament. The Torah wants to tell us that how you bring that, that, that to the Mizbeach and how you do it. The owner hand should be above with the fats and the breast placed in it. The Torah's hand should be beneath it, beneath the owner's hands, and that's the way they waved it. The owner held fats and the innards and the breast of the animal, and then the Torah put his hand underneath the, the, the person's hand. Asisha Hashem. And what is the fire offering referred to here? They have the fat of the, of the breast. As she said, when you bring it before slaughtering, before from the slaughtering area, he places the fat on the breast. But when he gives it into the hands of the client who is performing the waving, the breast is situated above and the fat below. That's why it's mentioned elsewhere, they bring the thigh of the elevated offering and the breast as a waving offering upon the fat fire offering to wave. After the waving, he gives it a client who will burn it. The breast is now situated below and the fats above. This was stated in the verse 9, chapter 9, verse 20. And they placed the fats upon the breast and he caused it to go up as a spoke on the altar. We learned that there are three kahanim required or are required for it as explained in Mesechta Menachas. It took three kahanim. They gave the the, the, the client that did it with, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the Jew, and then they put it into the in, into the next client. The next client brought it up to, to the to the altar, the ramp. We gave it to the third client who threw it on the mizbeach. As a chayla achazi of Vienna, why is the breast brought? The way it 
he brings it, but not that it should be a part of the fire offering. Since it's stated, the fire offering to the Lord, the fat on the breast, one might think the breast is also included in the fire offering. Therefore, the Taylor continues the breast to wave. And the coin causes up the fat to go on to smoke on it. But the breast goes to add in a coin or So the, the breast, actually, the meat of the breast doesn't be put on the, on the, on the altar. The breast is given to the coin. And afterwards, the breast shall be given belong to our Hence, we learn that the meat of the sacrifice shall be eaten. Well, the sacrifice parts are still on the altar before they have been burnt. So they got, the coin had to eat, start to eat. He had to cook the meat while that sacrifice is being burnt and to eat the meat. And also the right thigh. Also, he gets the breast and the right thigh. From your offering. So the coin got the breast and the right thigh. thigh. The rest of the, the carbon was given to the Jew who ate the carbon. He could have taken it, taken it to Jerusalem and make a celebration with all people that were pure. Shake. That, what means the right thigh? is a part of the animal's hind leg extended from the knee point, the bone, and the flesh of which are usually sewed together with the head. Up to the middle joint of the upper leg, which is called regal saver. The animal leg has three sections to it. Thus, the shake is the middle of those three sections. Anyone of the sons of Adam who offers the blood, the peace offering, and the fat, he shall have the right thigh as a portion. Now she says again, this teacher is one who's fit to perform the dashing of its blood and the burning of its sap. Thus excluded the one from receiving a share in the meat of the breast and the thigh, a coin who's unclean, the time of the dashing of the blood, or the time of the bringing of the fats. If he's unclean, even though he became clean later, he's not allowed to eat from this offering. Verse 34, for the breast of waving, the shake at room and the thigh of elevation. I took it from the Jewish people. From the sacrifice of the peace offering. The Etna is on the Aaron Akrain. I gave it to Aaron. The Kayan, Ulavana, and his children, Lachot, Eilam, it's an everlasting tattoo. Ace Benes. So the Ash is Tnufa, Truma means Tnufa means waving, the leaning forward and backward notion. Well, truma is elevation, then only upwards. So since both terms are used here, we learn that the crane would move forward, backwards, upwards, downwards. I could do a little bit of, a little bit of an essay. Forwards, backwards, upwards, downwards. And that was called Tanufa and Truma. These are the grant. These are the givings to Aaron and to Anointed of his sons, Meisha Hashem from the burning fire of God. He can raise the day that he sacrifices Lachan Hashem to be a claim to God. Verse 36, Vashativ Hashem lost his lamb, which God commanded to give to them. The Yem Mashkrei, the day that they were anointed. Meis Bnei Yisrael from the Jewish children, from the children of Israel. Hukas Elam, the reason this is an eternal stature for their generation. This is the law of a burnt offering. I mean, whether it's to a meal offering, lachatas, whether it's a sin offering, lachatas, whether it's to a guilt offering, lemeluyim, or it's an investor into when they became tehadim, lezev achshlamim, and to a peace offering. Asher lemeluyim, liyem, kinuch hakona. This in this is the day of initiation, the into kona day, the initiation, the day they were initiated, become a kain. As a shir Hashem is made by Sinai. Which God commanded Moshe and Mount Sinai, the Yom Sabbaths may sell the day commanded the Jewish people, the Hakis Kabbenim to bring the sacrifices, Lashem, to God in Midbar Sinai, the desert. That completes the Chumash. And now I go to the Tanya of the day. So the Al Tadabba ended yesterday that. Um, 
Yud Kei Vav Kei. He divided it into four, also into four, into the four categories of creation, inanimate vegetation is the lower two cover, is the lower the, low, the, the the concept of the lower two concept of the vessel of the mitzvah. The inanimate is just the goof, the mitzvah itself. The the uh, vegetation, the vegetation is like the, the kavana of the of, of the goof. And then he he, he said it is so too in kavana itself. There is the higher level, the lower level. Which is the difference between man and an animal? Al Tanebe goes now to discuss the two levels of kavan: the higher one, which is compared to the soul of man, and the lower one, which is compared to the soul of the animal. First level is a person discerning enough to know God. A person who has the capability is smart enough, and he has the mind capability to be able to know God in his mind. And what means knowing God and contemplating on God is that he will be able to create with his bina, with his wisdom. He will be able to create a lofty fear of God. The mind in his mind. But Avis Hashem create a love of God. In the, in, the, in, the, in the right side of his heart, the divine, see the divine emotions. So that's really when a person has the capability of contemplation. That is contemplation, is meditation. Creates a true love, at least a spiritual love. So that his soul should so thirst for God. The dove can wait to cleave to God. Because that's the nature of the soul, to cleave to God. So it doesn't take, I mean, it takes, it takes contemplation, but it takes the concept to be able to meditate, to awaken up my soul in my brain and in my heart, to be able to have a true Abbas Hashem, which the soul has. And ultimately, this love of God will be shown in the way I act. I will serve the Abishta and play the mitzvah with love because I have the capacity of understanding. I have the capability of meditation to awaken up in my brain a love of the Abishta that will resonate in my heart. To love God, and when I do a mitzvah, I do it with love. Which illuminates, will be, my heart will be illuminated by the infinite light of God. Al nafshay, on my soul. The dove could be to cleave to him. So, in other words, this person desired to cleave to God. Though the only means of doing so is to tell the mitzvah stems from the love and awe of God created by intellectual appreciation of God's greatness. His kavane mitzvah, his desire to keep to God through mitzvah, thus has an intellectual basis. And that's each person according to his intellectual capability. And with this intellectual capability, this thought, kavana, intention, he learns Torah and he does mitzvah. And so with this intention, he davens. And he says other blessings. It's in essence, he has the kavana that he's cleaving to God. He comprehends it according to his capability, and everybody's going to comprehend it differently. What means to them cleaving to God? Or what means to them connection to God? Every person according to his capability, and every person according to capacity, whose greatness he has come to understand. Each person, how much he can understand. So this kavana, that I have, that I can conjure and I can create in my mind. Well, Derech Marshall is analogous, is analogous to Kamenishma Sabadava. It's like the soul of a human being. Because the soul of a human being 
of a medaber, who's somebody who speaks, who balsechel, what makes you different than animal is that you're intellectual, you have choice, and you speak with wisdom. You're not speaking emotionally, you're speaking through wisdom. And that's what makes you different than animals. So that's why this, this kavana, that I have kavana, I take my free choice to comprehend God, to understand God. And I create to my capability, to my capacity, to my understanding of godliness. And I create a love of God through my understanding. And that is through my free choice that I've decided to create this love. So that's one level that I use my brain to the best of my capacity. And I can contemplate on God in this. I meditate. I learn. And that creates a love of God within me and creates a reality of action. We should die to God. But then you have those second level. A person who understanding is so too limited. He doesn't have that capacity. He doesn't have the capacity. He has intellect. We all have brain. So we all have intellect. But this, all this learning is not creating a love. It's just staying in my head. It doesn't create a love of God. Because I'm very limited in the brain area. So therefore, the second level of Kavad is a person whose understanding is too limited to know and to reflect on the greatness of blessing and say, Lord, let me be nothing. To create an understanding, a revealed love in his heart. It's godlessly. And to have to be able to have awe in his mind and dread of God in his heart. So his level of understanding is inadequate to create a palpable spiritual emotion. Since one to look at, look at the explanation of it, since one's observance of mitzvahs is contingent on love of God, we said before, the kavana, without kavana, you don't have, it's like a goof play in the shamas. And refraining from sin is contingent on fear of God. How can, how can one who cannot evoke these emotions because it's limited of understanding fulfill the mitzvah, Torah mitzvahs, what motivates him? So, if, so then you never have a neshama. Then, then my mitzvah, that's a terrible thing. I'm a limited individual. My mind is limited, and therefore I realize that I don't have true, doesn't awaken up, my, my intellect doesn't awaken up any true ava. So, so then I, all my mitzvahs, I could go for light and shama. All my mitzvahs are like a body without a soul. So the Alter Rebbe helps us out, he saves us. Such a person, the Alter Rebbe says, will, the Alter Rebbe will say, is motivated by his arousal of his hidden love. The love of God, which comprises the aspect of fear hidden in the heart of that age. And that's why the Alter Rebbe says, ultimately, everything we do is out of love. Whether we think we're not doing it out of love, whether we think we don't have love, every Jew loves the Abish. Every Jew loves God. So even if he cannot arouse this love to reveal state, we can actually feel the love and fear of his heart. He can surely arouse in his mind so that, so that at that level, he will experience a conscious desire to attach himself to God. This desire will lead him to study Torah and fulfillment since this is the way, the only way, in, re, in way he realizes his wish to, to connect to God. So he, he, that's why he's doing it. So he, in, the act, in the aspect of his kavana, of why he's doing it, is because he has decided consciously, free choice, to do. His kavana created that, he, that he's doing the mitzvah, that he's davening, that he's learning, he's praying, that he's learning. The problem is missing the ava, missing the love, missing the emotion. 
In this case, his kavana in Torah study in mitzvahs is based on the instinct, meaning in the innate love of God found in this heart. That's the concept of that explains that in the, 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 the not real reason is the real reason. So in the, because since we have an instinct love, we have a true love of God, it's just hidden. So therefore, ultimately, everything is based on that. We would not ultimately do anything if it wasn't because this Abbas Hashem that is hidden in us, in our subconscious. So it might not be the conscious love, but ultimately, this subconscious love brings us to begin with to even contemplate a mitzvah, to even want to do a mitzvah, to even have the kavana to even want to do a mitzvah. If it wasn't for that hidden love, why would we any? Why would any Jew do any mitzvahs? Because every Jew do, who ultimately does mitzvahs because he has a love of our Kaddish Baruch. So even though it's not a it's not a, a, a conscious love, he doesn't feel this love in a conscious way. Every Jew subconsciously loves a Kachba. And that ultimately is will be revealed in this mitzvah, even though it's not going to be revealed in a conscious way. So in this case, it's Kavan of Torah Story Mitzvah, desire to cleave to God is based on this love. This level of Kavana therefore resembles the soul of the animal. His actions are instinctive, not rational. And that's why ultimately it shows that, most, that we all do mitzvahs, not because we have a true Ava, because that's, our, that's who we are. That's who we are. So you, you, the truth is, where does it, that's why it's in, in, in Hatsi, where, where does it show the essence of a person? It's not an exotic per se. It's a Jew that doesn't have the true Ava. There he shows his true essence. Because every Jew would not do Taita Mitzvah is not that he didn't have this, this, this supernatural love. And that's why we do things that we don't have a, a true avatu, a true revealed avatu. We do it because God wants us to do it. So when a person does something, and he does something because he has a true instinct love, which subconscious shows much more deeper concept than a person would do it with his outer love, because that comes from his own intellect. While a person that does something because he's inner, because that's who he is, he doesn't know why. He's a Jew. I don't know. That's why most Jews, they're Jews. They, 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 they're Jews. They might, might be doing Torah mitzvahs, they might, might be doing things that they should do. But they're Jews. So it's, it's, like a, it's like a super, it's like a subconscious concept. It's a, it's a love that's not based on anything. It's a love, because the regular love needs to be based on something. I love you, therefore I do something for you. Here, I don't have to do anything, in essence. Or well, the Jew thinks he doesn't have to do anything. He just has an instinct love of God. He's Jewish. He's different. The Alter Rebbe says, ultimately, every Jew, when he does a mitzvah, and he does the mitzvah because he doesn't have real contemplation. And therefore, since he doesn't have real contemplation, real meditation, he doesn't have real open ava to this mitzvah. But he does it because he has instinct love, a not rational love. He's not a, 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 a love that's based on rational. It's a love that's based on instinct. It's a love that's based on his essence. It's an ava, what's called in in, in it's ava misuteris. It's a love that is hidden. And that's why we do. <laughs> and that's the point. And that's the power of this ava misuteris. That's the power of this hidden love that it gets Jews to do the right thing. When it comes down to, to Pesach, Jews, majority of Jews, over 95% of Jews, will do the right thing. Why? They don't know why. Because they're Jewish. And that's what they'll do the right thing. They have an avamous status. They have an inner love to God. And they got to do the right thing. Whether they comprehend it, whether they have feelings to it, whether they are, they are over-ecstatic about it, they're going to do it. 
They're going to do it because they're Jewish. And the Neshama is, not, is, is, is telling them to do it, whether they have an understanding, whether they don't have an understanding. He merely calls and arouses a natural love. He knows to do. That's his natural love. I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew, and therefore I do it. That's it. That's a nat that's an instinct love. Finish. There's no question that we're going to rationalize it. I can't imagine my demand. I don't have the great capacity of rationalization. So I'm far from understanding it and seeing the beauty in it and seeing the godliness in it that I don't see it and I cannot create this thing within me. But I have an a, a instinct that tells me I need to do this. And that is that hidden love that, that pushes every single Jew to do the right thing. And it comes out. He asks him why he's doing it. That's what a Jew does. That's what a Jew does. So we're paying 10, 50, 20, 30 dollars a pound of matzah. That's national. Who would buy that for so much money? Because that's what you got to do. You got to eat matzah. And that's what I'm going to do. Does it make rational sense? No. But I have a love to God, and God wants me to eat matzo. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? So even if he can arouse the revealed feeling of love of his heart, surely he can summon it to a mental conscious. A tzaddik, for example, he sees the beauty in a matzo. He sees the value that's worth more than that. He goes, well, what would he do to do this mitzvah? And it's truly amazing, you should know, that we saw throughout history, that Yidin were most nefesh on this mitzvah. Not to eat chametz on Pesach. Not to eat, to eat matzah on Pesach. Gave up their life. Maybe they didn't do this, didn't do most of other mitzvahs. They gave up their life. Suddenly they had this ava that was supernatural because every mitzvah comes from ava that is supernatural. That's above rationalization. It's who we are. It's this Ava Mesotetis. It's this hidden love of who we truly are to why we truly do everything. She did say him, she would that he will in his mind and in recess of his heart to approve and consent completely willless and in perfect sincerity. And therefore, ultimately, we do mitzvahs. We do what, what we do mitzvahs with perfect sincerity. We do it because we believe we're Jews. And the, the mitzvah, even though we're not going to feel any great revelations, even though we're not going to feel any great arousal of love, we do it because we, we're supposed to do it. Why do you do it? I don't know why I do it, because I have, I'm a Jew. And then what is pushing you to do it? What is pushing you if he doesn't? What is pushing you to even rationalize it? Why would you rationalize something that you have no feeling to it, that you see no greatness from it? Why is pushing you? That's that Abba Mr. Tennis. That is that hidden love that is pushing you, pushing me to do the right thing. That I'm ready to even give sacrifice. As I said, I'm going to give my life away to do this mitzvah. That doesn't make any sense. So I, I, have this, I want this unity with God. I know this mitzvah is going to unite me with God. Do I have any feeling from this thing? Do I see the, the, the spirit? Do I see the unity? No. But I know it's, it's true. I know it's true. In order to attach him, attach him, him to the divi his divine soul in the garments of thought, speech, and action, and to unite with them in this unity. When Jews come together, Mitch, and they come on Pesach together, they're doing a mitzvah. They might think they're coming together, celebration of the family. They're doing a mitzvah. They're doing the wish of God. The baby said, come together on Pesach and eat matzah. And eat mar. And, and all Jews are pushed to that. And so do other mitzvahs. 
that Jews are pushed to do. And they have, they have ultimately in their mind established this is a good thing, even though they don't see the spirituality. They don't see that they don't feel the that somehow some that my soul is thirsting God. I, I, I feel the connection. I feel the connection. And it is a connection, but it's a, it's a hidden connection <laughs> because it comes from a hidden place. She adopts an alien, which is the which is when I do the mitzvah, is my do it because I'm cleaving to God, I become one with God, whether I comprehend it or not. That's what God wants, because that's the will of God. I'm a Levulvish, which is enclosed, the Talmud in the learning of Torah, or Bikila Mitzvah, in every mitzvah that I do. What is, it, what is enclosed in that mitzvah? The will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I'm doing the will of God. And I want to do the will of God for some reason. I want to do the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, whether I, when I see greatness, when I, when I have great feeling, for some reason, I have decided rashly in my brain that I'm going to do the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I'm going to do the will of God. Which is truly amazing. So like Maitadrum, as he says, the one who undergoes out of the love of God, the study of Torah, and performance mitzvahs, unites the soul with God. Therefore, one's arousal of his natural love of God to the point where he's prepared to offer his life to God's unity will also motivate him to fulfill Taylor mitzvahs. So if I'm ready to give my life up to God, which is above rationalization, why would anybody give up his life for God, for anybody? Because I can't separate myself from God. I can't pray, I can't separate. God's going to tell me, bow down to an idol. I can't do that. Because for whatever reason, I know that's a separation from God, which I cannot do. So too, we do tell you the mitzvahs in general because we did, we're doing the will of God. That's what gave us to wants us. And where do you get this from? Because I have a love of God. I have a hidden love of God. I cannot separate myself from God. That's what the Alter Rebbe would say, a Jew, not he can and not he wants to be separate from God. It's impossible. He might say things, he might think things, but that's not his true entity. His true subconscious hidden aspect of himself every year is a person who loves HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that's why a majority of Jews do, does things. A majority of Yudin that are not great Talmud Chachamim, they're not great sages, not great Sadiqim, not great pious people. They do things because of this album. They do things because of this hidden love. And, and they conjure in their mind intellectual reasons of why they're willing to do this hidden love. Why they're willing to do the mitzvah. But really, the real reason is not because they see the connection of God with this mitzvah, but then they would do it because of the connection. They saw the spirituality. Imagine every mitzvah you did, you saw God coming down. You would run to do every mitzvah. They, 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 they just do it because they have this hidden love that we all have. And also the natural, that's like this natural love comprised of the fear of God. We all are, we are all in awe of God. We all are in awe of HaKadosh Baruch. The Kabbal Malchus accepts his dominion. We all don't want to rebel again. No Jew wants to rebel against God. No Jew wants to break his connection to God. There's no such thing. Because that's his essence. His essence is subconscious. His inner essence is his love of HaKadosh Baruch and is all of God, therefore it's impossible to rebel against God. It's what he thinks he wants to do. It's not the essence of who he is. And when motivated by this covenant, we all can have this simple covenant. We all can have this simple covenant because we all know this, this intention. We all know we love God. We struggle. We have struggles with our understanding, with our with the, with our with God, we might have we might have struggles, but we all know that why we struggle with God because we love Him. If we didn't care about God, we wouldn't have any struggles with Him. So we all know that we all have an inborn love of God and fear of God, and that alone, if we have kavanah, that alone, 
how much we, in essence, love HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We are ready to go Jews throughout history, ready to go on Mestir HaSnefesh and self-sacrifice. The Gemara says that the simple Jews were ready to go on self-sacrifice more than the prophets were ready to go on self-sacrifice. And Jews throughout history went on self-sacrifice and they were not great prophets. And they were not great people, intellectually and spiritually, but they were Jews. And therefore, every Jew, be it may who he is, has this oven, is ready to go on Mesir HaSnefesh, ready to go on self-sacrifice to God. You should be able with that kavon alone. If we can just touch that essence, if we can just think for a moment that we have within us to the Abishta, which is true and it's real. We should never come on to the, so the, 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 the challenge of self-sacrifice. But we know we have that capability. We should be able to overcome all our other challenges. That Ava should be enough to get us, to keep us on the right track. And one from turning away from evil, refrain from doing sins and do good by reserving mitzvahs and the study and prayer and the sight of God. So therefore, ultimately, this Ava, this hidden Ava, can become part of every mitzvah that I do. I just have to think about it for a second. I'm going to do the mitzvah, which is the shell, which is the body, but I'm really doing this mitzvah because I have Ava Sashem, because I love God, because I'm ready to, I, I never want to separate myself from God. I'm a Jew. I will I want, to, I want to always be a Jew. And this is Peter Shah Middleslabad. And this is thinking merrily of the meaning of the words without the chiller chimur, without conscious. Again, you don't have conscious love. Not, that's the, that's it. You're not going to have conscious love. And you're not going to have fear of God in your heart. You're just not going to have it. You don't have the capacity for it. Wow, but this is enough. For me, it's enough which would lend emotional intensity in his prayer, lacking revealed love and fear. He prays only by the meaning of the words. He only saying the words. When one fulfills Torah in this manner, he's learning, he only understands the words. He's davening. He doesn't have great love of a neighbor. He doesn't have great fear. He's just davening. He's davening because that's what God wants him to do. And that's what he really wants to do. Arikavana zu. I'm telling you, this kavana, my kavana, it analogies the soul of an animal which possesses neither intelligence nor freedom of choice. That's, that is true. It's not because one's intelligence, not because he chose, because who he is. And whose emotions, its fears of harmful things, and its love of pleasing things are merely naturally to it, like the animal. Not a product of intelligence or understanding. So too is the example, it's an analogy. Just like the animal. We're talking about a spiritual animal. Only a physical atom. Thus, the animal live on instinct, the way the Abish to created it. That's why the animal will do what it does, not because it's good or bad, because that's why God created it. It lives on instinct. So too, this love is on instinct. They too are not a product of intellect and choice. It's because who I am. So the first level of kavana is who I am, is not who I am, is what is my intellectual being, is my part of my seichel. That I had kavana, I understand God, I contemplate God, I comprehend God. But this ava is not because of, uh, of, of because I understand God. It's my instinct. It's like an animal who has instinct, only has instinct. So do I have this ava because of my instinct. And where do I get this instinct? And you do show us saying this is an inheritance, this instinct, this Ava Mr. this love was given to me by Avram Avinu. It's like a natural instinct in our soul. In this Galeel, as I mentioned, let's mention the book. 
So the Alter Rebbe explained it, that the patriarch bequeathed to their descendants an internal inheritance, a divine soul with instinct love and fear of God. Because this love is merely instinctual, not natural, and I'm sorry, and natural. It's function as motivated covenant for fulfillment of Torah mitzvahs likened to the soul of an animal. Now, today I said, gave us a beautiful picture over here to summarize. Both performance of kavan and mitzvahs are divided into two categories. The two levels in performance body of the mitzvah is a comparison to the two classes of body creatures in, in inanimate beings and plants. They are mitzvahs performed with action, physical action, like a physical, like a rock. And mitzvahs performed through speech is like vegetation. Two levels of kavana, of the soul of the mitzvah, corresponds to the two classes of the souls, creatures, and animals, and men. They are the, a, the kavana generated by one's intellectual com- contemplation of godliness, that's like man, and the kavana arising from one's natural love and fear of God, and that's like concept. What a beautiful, beautiful station. Now, the Rebbe is going to continue. But if you understand this, you'll be able to create within yourself the importance of these two entities. And then both are important. If you can create some aspect of love, of fear of God through you and intellectual into intellect, you should do that. But if you can't, you should fall back on your basic, natural avid to the Ebishter, which each and every one of us has. And if we can all go and reveal that avid mistress, that true hidden love, which we, we do reveal in the time of a challenge, if we can reveal it, every time when we come to Davin, if we can reveal that, that we're coming to davening because we're Jews. And this is what the Ebishter wants. The Ebishter wants us to Davin. They wish to want us to learn. They wish to want us to do this mitzvah. And I'm, and I'm ready to go on Messina Snefish because that's my nature. My nature is I love God, not because of my intellect, not because I comprehend, not because I chose it. I love God because that's who I am. I cannot not love God. I cannot not fear God. It's not possible. It's impossible. What a beautiful teaching of the Alter Rebbe today. Well, if I, we could be able to live that teaching of the Alter Rebbe today in our daily lives, that we can be able to, to have that, uh, to realize this Abba Mesuteris, this hidden love. It's not love based on intellect, it's instinct love that we all have. That my, as we, as other experiment, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, we are believers, the sons of believers. We are who we are because it's a Yerushim Amisenu, it's an inheritance that was given to us. It's within us. It's impossible to take it out of us. It doesn't make a difference how far or how close we are. It's impossible to, era- to take this, this Ava away from the Yid. And therefore, Rama writes in this, no Jew who were left behind. Ultimately, every Jew will do tshuva. Every Jew, whether this Gilgal or another Gilgal, they will do what is right. Because it's impossible for them not to do what is right. Partially impossible for them. That that they're not doing right is their fantasy and their illusion. But the truth is a yid, as I said before, the Alter Rebbe statement, a yid nishta can or nishta will. Thine upgrade is from God. A Jew, not he can, and not he really, not he wants to be cut off from God. It's impossible, but that's his essence. That's his essence. His essence is that he's a part of God. So not he wants, and not he truly can be cut off from a Kaddish and we need to awaken up that Abba Mister. We need to try to awaken up that Abba Mister, this hidden love that we have, and bring it and connect it to every mitzvah that we do, to every good deed, to every davening, to every learning, to every mitzvah that we do. And that will bring the concept as the Alter Rebbe will continue, the neshama to the guf, the neshama to the guf. So even though we're not tzaddikim, we're not going to be able to bring true Abba to the to 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 the to the mitzvah. Will bring this Ava Mesutanis, and in a way, it's even greater than the Ava that comes through intellect. Because Mesutanis is the Yerusha, something that was given to us by God through, the, through Avram Avinu, Avram Yitzhak Yankiv, 
So it's a true Abba that is not connected to any intellectual concepts. It's the essence, the essence. That's why the Alter the Alter Rebbe said the Baal Shem Tev came to reveal the greatness of the Avoda of simple people. That the Avoda of a simple person is the Avoda of these Adam status that he does mitzvahs not because of his intellect, he does it because that's what he is. And that's who he is. And that reveals his true essence, his love to God, not based on why he thinks he loves God or his contemplation or his meditation. Because that's what he is. Who cares what is the meditation? He loves the Abishta because he's a Yid. And he has an Ashama. And therefore, he loves God. We'll continue with Mitchum tomorrow, but that ends the, the, the Tanya of the day. Today is the sixth day of the month, which is chapter 35 to chapter 38. If you do those four chapters, you're done the Chitas of the day. I wish you all a wonderful and happy day in Mitchum. We'll continue tomorrow. We'll continue tomorrow at 8 a.m.